Hello, uh, thank you for having me uh, today. I'm gonna try to wrap uh, maybe a bit of the future theme back in after these very impressive uh, also presentations on, on the work that Mark just now. And I think also his comments in the beginning on, on the role of technology was very adequate and very yeah, impressive. I'd like to start out with the question of actually um, what motivates design. So for me, it's a lot about uh, both fascination for steering of form and also design exploration. And the question what is actually underlying this whole design exploration. So in this case, um, it's the question of the model. So can we actually concept conceptualize on the advances in technology? Can we actually make sense of it? Or is it actually being stuck in the conventions, uh, not perpetually, but certainly it's a strong, it takes a strong effort to break out of the conventions and actually face new possibilities with technology. So in this case, it's also the question of control. So what are the vehicles we have to, um, to operate on? So in this case, it's mostly still geometry and numeric uh, information. And uh, ultimately, yeah, conflict resolution. And this is then often still the output surface in one way or another, um, which is also different, very much governed, I think, by the, um, by the dominance of geometry, especially architectural geometry in this case, uh, which always struggles with materialization. We have seen many examples already in the last uh, two days. So is, <coughs> is surface as it is still one of the dominant paradigms, no matter if it becomes volumetric or not? The actually uh, the, the answer to a lot of the challenging um, questions in architectural design, hence also are the tools we're dealing with adequate for uh, dealing and representing these design problems, or are we actually mostly dealing with uh, representation in the sense? And the actual thinking and, and design and solution of designs happen still in our minds and not necessarily in the machines where we would hope technology would actually make a difference. Um, so this is just a small screen, uh, shot, actually um, um, a capture of a movie and animated, um, not animated, but programmed um, interpolation script, which just takes just the vector field and averages the, uh, the directions of the vectors and puts a surface over it. So it's the reveal that we tend to project a lot of things into the beauty of the uh, potentially beautiful uh, artifact that uh, it resolves in, in, into, but the actual technique, let's say numeric technique is very simplistic underneath. So um, can we get more, let's say, than the aesthetic output from it as in the sense, can we leverage technology to actually help us in complex design problems? And do we have the models to do that actually? I think ultimately it's a question of a crisis of models and that's not model in the sense of geometry, but more the scientific or the thinking model and not necessarily just that it's not rigorous enough. I think that we have heard also from Hanan that sort of question um, is one uh, not allowed to be sort of non-rigorous or sloppy or all that. I think we have to be all the time, but it doesn't mean that we also cannot, um, we're not allowed to develop new models that actually match our desires uh, and are not just sort of uh, trying to settle on other models that have been de developed in dif other disciplines. So I think that's a very different, uh, a very difficult question, how we can actually match our representational um, capabilities with our design uh, questions and also develop models that are adequately complex and responsive and actually are developed by us as designers rather than looking for them um, uh, to respond to that and ultimately leverage potential advances and then also in, in technology and then also allow us to see or find novel things uh, that break, break out of paradigms. So a few examples from my own work uh, maybe to illustrate that. So behavior is quite interesting. So if one simulates a simple traffic si simulation here, which I did as part of the Smart Cities group, I work on the concept car design for a few years under Bill Mitchell. Um, this was sort of the attempt to see if there could be some any be emergent behavior in, in traffic uh, as related to cars um, that became sort of uh, difficult and also not particularly interesting uh, because it lies uh, sort of in the detail ultimately in scale. But what if one relieves some of these constraints and actually tries to break some of the paradigms? So traffic may look like this, that you actually have more sort of a, a herd of cattle uh, brushing up against each other and cars sort of, instead of being these sort of per perfect uh, constructs uh, become sort of things that rub against up against each other, so uh, Joachim Mitchell was one of the big proponents in that uh, class of that, so I wrote a simulation like that to see what that may look like, and then taking these sort of ideas, uh, rather than coming from the stylistic idea of how this body may look and be novel by sh reshaping it, really questioning some of the fundamentals. So for instance, in this case, the skin becomes soft and flexible around a sort of ch uh, changing body, 
and that has implications, of course, and destroys a lot of the optimizations of, let's say, 100 years of design in that very sort of stable uh, design environment of concept cars. Um, then the other question is social configurations. So why are, for instance, in the car domain, which of often helps to break out of your domain to do really bad work, in another domain, because you're not afraid so much of, of uh, sort of you just play. Uh, so the question of the car, why they're all the same? Um, can we not take other drivers, such as social configurations, um, as a starting point? So uh, if you just take driver, passengers, et cetera, and the different components and regroup them really combinatorial in different ways, you can very di quickly discover and reinvent almost every, uh, every automotive sort of solution out there and it becomes much more um, sort of enjoyable to work because you don't feel like uh, you have to reinvent uh, everything and you can actually describe it rather quickly. Um, but at the same time, once you do that, then what could be different relationships between uh, these sort of social uh, agents, in this case, driver, passenger, all the things become, yeah, uh, you can throw them up in the air and question the roles that have been attributed. So also in this case, maybe it's a collaborative thing of actually steering and interacting with this, maybe the actual devices we're so used to, like a steering wheel, disappear in, in, in favor of the sort of 12-degree um, yeah, freedom seat that actually latches on and senses your movement and translates it into steering commands, which may be conflicting, and uh, you actually may crash, and it's a learning experience to, to drive uh, rather like a skier or such. Um, so ultimately, uh, also prototyping of all these things it's important, so again, these are not uh, solutions to any questions of mobility, which are ultimately the question of designing cars, it's mobility, so mo cars are actually very bad solutions for mobility. But if you break a lot of the paradigms, like here, trying to use servo models uh, in a very male um, fashion, as we learned yesterday, with square um, microcontrollers uh, building robotic cars, uh, you may realize a lot of things about uh, design, the design space of uh, cars, um, you, you question more things about cars than if you would have tried to improve on them. And so like like this, going through scales of, of complexity, this is a um, metal uh, prototype of this, and at the same time also always listening to what you're actually responding to design-wise. So I try to be quite rigorous about uh, the drivers, what motivates each of these uh, sort of iterations in the spirit of design exploration. So I'm very much <coughs> suspicious of the idea of using technology to confirm initial hunches or initial sketches, which I think has been sort of uh, almost the deathbed of uh, digital modeling in the last 10 years that uh, basically a lot of the big proponents and, and players uh, uh, have been sort of telling the story of how they had to wrestle technology into actually living up to their expectations and make what they knew from the beginning work. So I think I'd more interested in actually trying to teach discovery through technology, so actually trying to find things I didn't know or one didn't know or could not know um, uh, through that process. And I'm not saying that that's any better, I'm just saying there may be other things that could be added to that other, pr to that other, other approach. So one of them is, uh, was a project that started uh, 10 years ago, more or less, was looking at the combination of fabrication and scripting in 99, uh, basically uh, first laser cutter at MIT uh, for me and also first time scripting for me, trying to combine that in a physical sketching technique, if you will, uh, trying to find a way to combine things um, uh, connectionless so without any other um, screws or uh, attachment pieces, simply through friction fit and actually uh, double curvature induced by the resistance of the material. All that is completely commonplace now, but back then not so much. So it was a, a big sort of, uh, um, yeah, sort of aha moment for me to rethink sort of the role of geometry, not as sort of foam maker, but also actually as embodiment of, of the idea of construction and assembly. Then taking that idea a, f a few years later, trying to make a more holistic pro um, um, uh, component, a holistic sort of project of a chair, which would try to combine all these drivers, which I see as motivating factors in the sense uh, uh, of connection, assembly, curvature, material proportion, and fabrication. And you will notice the structure wasn't one of them. Um, and trying to find something that's somewhat fluid uh, that would uh, embody that and also technologically or technically, let's say, a design representation would, which would make it possible to find a cyclical uh, design exploration model that would allow for each of these push to push back and, and to take uh, sort of um, uh, uh, yeah, for, uh, pushing forces, so to say, from each of the other drivers. So if I change the material, I would want it to become uh, uh, changed and ripple through all the connectivities. These were some of the prototypes, three layers of prototypes, um, ultimately a stitching sort of uh, sequence of assembling the parts. All of the parts are flat and they get actually induced curvature through the sequential locking and snapping into place. 
Again, no glue or any other uh, fixing uh, device. It's all embodied in the sequential um, uh, detailing. So this is the final piece, which in this sense, uh, I think it was somewhat successful to actually achieve this flow, but you don't see the parts anymore. You actually see sort of parts in, in flow, uh, and they all hold each other together simply through uh, the assembly. Um, what wasn't successful was really the actual development of a, a model that would re respond to the idea of cyclical design exploration. So it was becoming very, very hierarchical uh, with a CATIA model, a parametric model sitting sort of like a spider in the center and controlling all, all the things in a top-down hierarchical way as opposed to a bi-directional um, model way where I could change one thing bottom-up and it would propagate uh, to the top and vice versa. So I think this is a crisis in a sense again because of the lack of or my failure to develop an appropriate model that would allow for that, although maybe I was able to wrestle the material into an object I was satisfied with to that point. Um, what is uh, then maybe led to a few other projects also, not necessarily sequentially. Um, the idea of uh, working with a responsive actuated uh, structures a project at MIT together with Philip Block and um, Peter Schmidt and John Snavely looking at what if we could make the structures that are not necessarily finite in their, uh, in their built form, but can actually respond ideally intelligently uh, to actuators, in this case, faster muscles, to wind gusts or uh, other, other, other sort of disturbances and reduce the worst case sort of structural scenario of a one kind uh, form into something that could be uh, uh, yeah, more uh, sort of uh, intelligent in its structural design, but thereby reducing also its, its overall footprint. So what turned out to be very grueling uh, process of building this with very inadequate uh, sort of uh, tools, et cetera, um, we managed to do actually in a few months' time uh, with very little budget. But what was interesting to me in terms of technology, based on some of the precedents like the hyperbody groups that work uh, with the muscle tile one and two, and some other like Fry Otto, uh, et cetera, the, the part that actually turned out to be impossible in the short time frame for us was control. So this is, in a sense, again, the question of uh, what are the actual challenges in, in technology. So control is far more difficult in this case than the actual artifact. You have eight degrees of freedom, and you have to sort of respond before the actual um, uh, uh, effect uh, starts taking place, especially with mass, mass and scaling up of these processes and also the need to be absolutely um, uh, fail-proof. Uh, as soon as you think of somebody sitting on the top of the tower, and we had several people climbing up on them, not intentionally, but <laughs> can't control that in public space, it becomes a bit uh, harder to think of these things as uh, failing prototypes, right? because you may kill someone with 800 pounds of, of uh, fiberglass falling down. So we did never dare to make it autonomous in any way, so we just had remote controls. So ultimately, again, our sort of hand-eye coordination uh, was filling in for maybe unfinished uh, technology. So performative, in a sense, can we also use this technology, again, as a sort of design exploration device, which embodies our understanding of the design problem uh, and uh, makes it more of a discovery process where the material behavior, and in this case, form-finding principles, uh, could be combined uh, to an interactive uh, sort of tool, if you want, or a player, like this is a uh, captured uh, um, sequence of, of moves of me designing, or not necessarily designing, but more throwing out uh, challenges to the system and it responds to uh, in a sort of a digital hanging uh, model fashion. The important thing is there, the, what the physical hanging model, we have seen it many times already, and of course it's nothing new, but the interesting thing here back uh, three, four years ago when it was made is to introduce the actual thickness response um, in, in accordance to the form uh, forces that flow through it and also playing a lot with uh, things like Andrew Bogart was mentioning, that's introducing secondary load cases to basically wiggle it around and see how, uh, how thick the actual uh, envelope would have to be in order to be more redundant and robust. But that was still, to me, not necessary steering of form, but really just uh, form finding. So I went on and did one more uh, iteration of that, trying to actually introduce a sort of a dirty form finding, if you want, or steering of form where you would be able to um, deal with a motorized uh, hanging chain. Uh, so in this case, it's a uh, simulated model where you can see the red arc part is actually capable of generating moment resistance um, progressively. So you can dial up and down the moment resistance and thereby actually steer your form into, let's say, suboptimal catenaries, meaning you can actually arrive at uh, more or less any form within 